Where exactly do we get manners from? Why does everyone follow these unwritten rules? What was etiquette like in the past? In this episode of Intrigued Mind, we'll be looking at the history of manners. There are the rules of society, and then there are the hidden meta-rules of society. If you speed, jaywalk, or park in a handicapped spot, you can get a fine and possibly even do some jail time. But if you do something that breaks the meta-rules, you can also get in trouble, even though they aren't written down anywhere. Someone might get offended if you sneeze without covering your mouth. You might blow a job interview if you don't shake someone's hand. How did we end up with these unwritten rules, also known as manners or etiquette? One of the earliest known advocates for manners was Ptahhotep, who was a high-ranking political advisor in ancient Egypt. He stressed the importance of manners in his writings and said that everyone had a duty to the people they share society with. He talked about how it's important to listen to other people and that avoiding conflict whenever possible should be considered a strength, not a weakness. Ptahhotep gave instructions on how you should behave in the presence of some great person, be they a political ruler or a military leader. This is an aspect of manners that isn't considered important today, and the average person rarely comes into contact with someone who is notably powerful. But when you work in the Egyptian court, it's something that would come up frequently. He also had some instructions for how to choose a good master and how you should serve him. Today, we would probably say that having any kind of slave to be immoral, but it was a different time. Ptahhotep did have some politeness guidelines for the elites themselves, who he said should rule with openness and kindness. Confucius was also famously big on etiquette. He liked to emphasize being moral and correct in your social relationships and said people should try and pursue justice in all their personal dealings. Things like lying or even exaggerating were seen as quite offensive to Confucius, who thought you should always be sincere with others. Later in history, people tried to turn these unwritten rules of manners into actual codified, organized rules for how to behave. Baldassare Castiglione, who was born in 1478, worked as a diplomat in Italy during the Renaissance. He wrote a book called The Book of the Courtier, in which he tried to answer all the questions of etiquette that might come up in Italian court. It became one of the most widely circulated books of the 16th century, which goes to show just how seriously people had begun to take manners in the courts of Europe during that time. So many books like this were written that they became their own genre and are referred to as courtesy books. Another famous courtesy book from the Renaissance era was titled On Good Manners for Boys and was written by Erasmus. In it, he explained how boys should act in order to start making the transition into becoming young men. He wrote that there are certain ways you should talk, walk, and act around adults. But he didn't stop there. Not only were there certain ways you had to walk, but there were proper ways to yawn and scratch your head too. It was intended to be practical advice for gaining an adult level of self-awareness. He assigned things like yawning a symbolic significance. A yawn was not just a yawn for Erasmus, but a way of showing other people what went on in your mind. Once a boy had finished Erasmus' book, he was supposed to have learned that the point of good manners is to be civil. We may not really care how people yawn anymore, but some of Erasmus' advice is timeless. For instance, he writes that boys should readily ignore the faults of others, but avoid falling short yourself. Louis XIV, King of France, used manners to make sure everyone knew he was the supreme ruler and absolute power in the country. He had many specific rules of etiquette that his nobles had to follow. His court was known for being so rigorously polite and ceremonial that foreign dignitaries were usually impressed when they visited his palace in Versailles. In Western Europe, this is usually how manners worked. They were created from the top down. The royal courts that had all the power would develop certain kinds of manners and then the lower classes would try to adopt them. People would try to emulate how the elites behaved. The elites have all the money and all the power after all, so it might be a good idea to try and ingratiate yourself with them and make sure you don't act in a way they might find impolite. You wouldn't want to offend a member of the court, but there would probably be no real consequence to offending a peasant, unless it was something really egregious, in which case they might try to stab you. But generally speaking, manners came down from on high. It is interesting to note that in modern American culture, things do not always come from the top down. Because the internet allows people of all social statuses to interact with each other all the time instantly, culture can now more easily move back and forth between economic classes. The nobles of past eras wouldn't be caught dead purposefully imitating some habit of the peasantry. But today, culture that's primarily associated with poor people actually gets passed up to the wealthier classes. For instance, you will notice that upper-class urban people will frequently say y'all and folks, despite the fact that these words were originally associated with poor rural people. But where exactly did we get all of our various forms of etiquette that we practice today? Cultural norms have many influences. Shaking hands, for instance, goes all the way back to ancient Greece, a civilization that is the source of many Western ideas and customs. Shaking hands was a sign of equality among citizens, as well as mutual respect. It came to replace signs of subservience, such as bows and curtsies, which was fitting for a democracy where people were equal under the law. Well, not everyone, since this was still several thousand years ago, but they were headed in the right direction. 
A handshake also served as proof that neither party was armed. Why do some people say bless you after someone sneezes? It's so ingrained into manners that people will even say it to complete strangers in public. For some people, it's as much of a reflex as sneezing itself is. There are two main theories as to where we get this custom. The ancient Greeks and Romans viewed sneezing as a sign of wellness. They thought of it like expelling negativity from your body, so they would offer blessings to the sneezer. A few centuries later, the bubonic plague made people start to really distrust sneezing. Pope Gregory VII called on everyone to utter a short prayer for someone after they sneezed, and so people started saying bless you to sneezers in case they actually had the plague. And since the plague killed 30-60% to 60 of the entire European population, there was a pretty good chance that they did have the plague. Why shouldn't you put your elbows on the table when you eat? This rule goes back to medieval times, when the courts would have huge feasts in great halls. Hundreds of people would eat together at long wooden tables. Sometimes, there wasn't as much space as there was food and people, and so you were supposed to keep your elbows down so that there would be room enough for everyone. When you dined in the royal presence of the lords and ladies, it was also thought to be too peasant-like to hunch over your plate and look like you were guarding your food from other people. It made you look distrustful and suspicious, and so it was best to keep your elbows down off the table. A medieval diner would have had some manners that would have been very different from ours. In medieval Europe, people frequently ate off the same plates with their hands and drank out of the same cup that was passed around the table. This wasn't because they had no concept of germs, although that's also true. It was because medieval society was simply more public and people had less of a sense of individualism and privacy. In the modern world, it would be considered bizarre for a whole table to share a cup, even if everyone was related. This practice was killed off by an increased feeling of individualism long before people discovered germs. We have, however, developed another piece of etiquette to compensate for this. Although we no longer all drink from the same glass, we do toasts, where we clink our glasses together and then all drink at the same time. This came about as a replacement to maintain that sense of communal connection to whatever words are being toasted. According to modern etiquette, you don't really need to clink glasses with every single person at the table. Instead of trying to reach across a bunch of people to clink a faraway glass, it's better to just raise your glass towards them and make eye contact. As we can see by looking back in time, manners change. What's considered polite today may not be considered polite in the future. That being said, you should probably avoid sneezing on people, even if in a few hundred years, people might not care about that anymore. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel. Like the video and leave your suggestions in the comments below.